From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. Former President of Brazil, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, has been authorized to leave prison in order to attend the funeral of his grandson, who passed away early on Friday. This follows a back and forth between officials. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Mir, has more. March 1st marks a very sad day in the life of former Brazilian President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. Early this morning, his seven-year-old grandson, Artur, got sick. His family took him to the hospital in Santo André, and hours later, he died from meningitis. In January, when Lula's brother Vava passed away, the local Curitiba courts broke Brazilian law and barred him from attending the funeral. This is a constitutionally guaranteed right in Brazil. In an average year, between 12 to 15,000 prisoners are temporarily released from prison, often in the presence of armed guards, and allowed to visit the funerals of family or loved ones. So as pressure builds on the right-wing Bolsonaro government over a series of corruption scandals and gaffes, it looks like they were unable to bar Lula from going to the funeral today. So basically, after a back and forth between the federal police, the local courts, and the federal public prosecutor's office, authorization was made. They're sending a helicopter to Curitiba as we speak, and it looks like he'll be flown in a small plane from Curitiba to Sao Paulo, where he will be allowed to go to the funeral of his grandson. Thank you, Brian. The United States Treasury Department has announced more sanctions against Venezuela, targeting six senior officers in the Bolivarian Armed Forces and police. They include the head of the National Guard and the commanders in charge of military and police forces on Venezuela's borders with Brazil and Colombia. The U.S. claims these units used force against civilians last weekend, but video evidence has shown opposition activists inciting violence against soldiers. Earlier, we were joined by Dan Kovalik. He's a professor of international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh. He spoke about how the U.S. has repeatedly meddled in countries around the world and how their support for the Contras in Nicaragua during the 80s could inform their current strategy against the government of Venezuela. It would not be difficult for the U.S. to use those paramilitaries in some type of Contra effort uh, against Venezuela. Now, what it would look like is very similar to the Contra War in Nicaragua. There's no way these paramilitaries could gain any ground or have any significant success against the Venezuelan military. But they could wreak a lot of havoc, they could kill a lot of people, and they could undermine the economy even further than the U.S. has undermined it by sanctions. So it's very dangerous. And again, unfortunately, in Colombia, the U.S. does have these paramilitary forces that can be used for these purposes and frankly have been used over the years against uh, Venezuela. And Elliot Abrams was one of the key uh, figures for Ronald Reagan who helped subvert U.S. law by funding uh, the Contras by illegal arms sales to Iran and also through uh, cocaine uh, sales that were used to fund the Contras. At the same time, we have to remember that Mr. Abrams was also a key figure behind the war in El Salvador and, and behind such massacres as the El Mazote massacre, which claimed the lives of 800 Salvadorans. This is a bad guy. The fact that he is in charge of Venezuelan policy should really give everyone a uh, pause. Social organizations in Paraguay have rallied to protest against the arrival of Venezuelan opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido to the country. Protesters gathered in front of the Paraguayan Foreign Ministry to demand the government stop supporting a coup in Venezuela. They sent their solidarity to Venezuelan, asking that Latin America remain a region of peace. And following last weekend's failed attempt to force so-called humanitarian aid into Venezuela by the U.S., backed opposition, both sides of the border are now suffering the consequences. Let's take a look at what happened in Cúcuta, Colombia, after international media left. 
This is how the Simon Bolivar Bridge, located on the Colombian-Venezuelan border, looked on Friday, February the 22nd. Fast forward to the 23rd, and that's the state it was left in. And it was the same scenario at the Santander Bridge, located a few kilometres north. As a result, the Colombian-Venezuelan border was closed permanently. Cameras, activists and lawmakers all left, but the aftermath has proven costly. This situation is only getting worse, because after they closed the border, we lost a lot of activity in our town. We have fewer work opportunities. Informal work is on the rise in Cúcuta. The government gives us nothing, no benefits, so we have very few options. The city lives of Venezuelans. Our supermarkets are closed. Street vendors are not able to sell their wares. And it's all because Venezuelans are not working anymore. After the concert and the whole circus surrounding it, they have left us in a dire situation. This attack against Venezuela was carried out with the political and logistical support of Colombian authorities who openly supported a coup d'etat. As usual, our city has been left to clean up the mess. Things are much more difficult now. There's more militarization. President Ivan Duque was in Cúcuta for three days, and he never once mentioned any of the issues in this city. Unemployment, extreme poverty, widespread violence, a border that's at mercy of armed groups in the hands of local drug trafficking gangs. They continue to work here as if nothing has happened. Cucuta is strategically located for a possible military invasion of Venezuela. There are many people who support a military invasion of Venezuela, but they have no idea what war is. They have never visited the region of Catatumbo or other regions where campesinos live or know how they live. 25,000 campesinos have been evicted from their lands in the north of Santander. About 5,000 people have forcibly disappeared, 217 people last year alone. Here in Colombia, we're living through a real humanitarian crisis. The coup failed, but the damage done to communities on both sides of the border is apparent. Venezuela has announced it will move the European headquarters of state-owned oil company PDVSA from Lisbon to Moscow. The decision was announced by Venezuela's Vice President Delcy Rodriguez after meeting the Russian Foreign Minister in Moscow. Rodriguez also said Europe no longer provides the necessary guarantees to protect her country's assets. Venezuela is also set to sign new trade deals with Russia that will focus on energy, agriculture and health. President Nicolás Maduro has ordered that the offices of state-owned oil company PDVSA in Europe located in Lisbon be moved to Moscow. This is a way of strengthening our cooperation ties. Russia will continue to assist the Venezuelan authorities in resolving social and economic problems, including through the provision of legitimate humanitarian aid. In general, we believe that the best way to help Venezuelans is to develop practical, pragmatic and mutually beneficial interactions. March 2nd marks the third anniversary of the death of Honduran activist Berta Cáceres. Let's take a look at the story of the indigenous leader who was murdered in her own home. In 2006, when the Honduran government announced construction of a dam on the Gualcarque River on the land of the Lenca indigenous people in Rio Blanca, the community felt their government had completely failed them. Not knowing what to do, they approached environmental activist Berta Caceres, who herself was a member of the Lenca community. Berta organized the community and confronted both the government and giant construction companies, including one of the world's largest construction companies, DESA. She knew how important the river was for the community and her people. When we started the fight for Rio Blanco, I would go into the river and I could feel what the river was telling me. I knew it was going to be difficult. But I also knew we were going to triumph, because the river told me so. Her undeterred fight and relentless determination to save the sacred river Gualcarque led her to win the prestigious environmental award, the Goldman Prize, in 2015. Somos custodios ancestrales del pueblo lenca. 
resguardados además por los espíritus de las niñas, que nos enseñan que dar la vida de múltiples formas por la defensa de los ríos es dar la vida para el bien de la humanidad y de este planeta. El Copín. Indeed, she gave her life to save her land and the identity of her community. On March 2, 2016, two armed men stormed her house and gunned her down. We place direct responsibility on the government for this situation. Although the ones who carried out this action might be hiring assassins paid by transnational capital. But this is the situation we're going through in Honduras. A regrettably dramatic and regrettable situation. At least eight arrests were made surrounding her mother, but no concrete action was taken to protect her family or other Honduran activists. Her mother was internationally condemned and drew a spotlight on Honduras. According to the NGO Global Witness, at least 124 activists have been murdered in the country since 2010, making it the most dangerous country in the world for environmental activists and land defenders. Widespread outrage against her killing led to the halt of the Agua Sacra Dam project. And a group of international experts known as GAPE was formed to investigate the murder of Berta Cáceres. A year later, GAPE found that DESA, the Honduran government, and the banks financing the project played a major role in the death of Berta Cáceres. Since the beginning, her death trial has been marred by cover-ups from the government. Three years have passed since Berta sacrificed her life, but many questions remain unanswered. Many involved in the plotting of her death are still free. Last year, four people were convicted, but the bigger fish from DESA remain untouched. Meanwhile, Berta's voice continues to resonate in the heart of the Lenka people. Despertemos, despertemos humanidad, ya no hay tiempo. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. A fire has destroyed a number of businesses in Berbiz in Guyana. The blaze caused extensive damage to a cinema, a restaurant, and two stores. Reports say that smoke was first seen coming from the cinema. The flames then spread to an empty building ne next door. Residents say they tried to extinguish the flames, but the heat from the fire was too much. Lyot, once the Caribbean's leading inter-island airlines, is now in serious financial difficulty and needs an emergency cash injection of 5 million U US to stay afloat. The airline only has enough cash to operate for just one week and is now facing a possible shutdown if CARICOM does not intervene. Part of the airline's problems is that it has been flying unprofitable routes. Lyot will now explore the possibility of economic cooperation with Trinidad and Tobago state-owned Caribbean Airlines. The heads of government were informed that Liat is in serious financial difficulty, needing within a matter of a fortnight an injection of minimum five million US in order to keep flying. Now, if Liat ceases to fly, I need not tell you the economic and other impact that that would have on the region. I have agreed to allow them to talk with Carl to see whether there is any economic benefit or possibilities for cooperation between Carl and Liat from that standpoint, purely from a business operations. The grand work has officially started on a brand new airport in St. Lucia, and its price tag is around $175 million. Prime Minister Alan Chestnut called the project a welcome development and great news for the tourism industry. The airport is slated for completion in 2021. Former Prime Minister Sir James Mitchell is calling for a ban on cell phones at polling stations in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He's justified his plea by saying that people can go into voting centers and take their photos to prove to politicians that they gave them their vote 
and demand something in return. He added that voting booths should only have plastic sheeting around them, so everything is done in the open. The first thing I want to say to you. And moving on, an 11-year-old Argentinian girl who was denied an abortion received a C-section this week, sparking a new debate about the country's strict abortion laws. The girl was raped by her grandmother's 65-year-old partner and had requested an abortion. Confusion over the girl's legal guardianship caused a delay until her 23rd week of pregnancy. At that point, some doctors refused to carry out the procedure. Last August, the Senate rejected a bill to legalize abortion in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy. And hundreds of Argentinians protested in Buenos Aires as President Mauricio Macri delivered a speech at Congress about his economic policies. People have widely rejected Macri's austerity policies, economic recession, and tax hikes. Heavy security personnel was deployed around the capital to face these protests. During his speech, Macri defended his policies and said Argentina is in a better situation than back in 2015 when he took office. Macri's government clearly defends interests opposed to ours, students, workers, and everyone who is exploited in this country want a different political answer. That is why we reject Macri. This government has made an agreement with the International Monetary Fund to bring hunger and misery in health and education. Our correspondent in Argentina, Edgardo Esteban, has more details. Buenos Aires woke up with thousands of security personnel surrounding Congress, where President Macri spoke about his economic policies. At the same time, social organizations, labor unions, and human rights organizations rallied to protest against those same policies. At first, they decided to protest in front of Congress, but that was impossible due to heavy security presence. People are rejecting a recent price hike imposed by Macri's government on taxes. They are also against the president's speech since it does not reflect the reality of the country. We thank Edgardo for that report. Former executives of the companies involved in building Colombia's troubled Ituango Dam will face criminal charges. Thousands of people had to leave their homes in areas near the dam after serious structural faults were detected. Colombia's Attorney General is bringing charges against former directors of Hidro Ituango. They are accused of irregularities in the process of tendering for the building of the dam. The Attorney General's office announced that it is formally accusing Guillermo Gómez, Hidro Ituango's former manager and Luis Javier Duque, the former manager of EPM Ituango, of irregularities in the awarding of contracts. For his part, the public prosecutor, Fernando Carrillo, told the first public hearing on the case in Medellin that EPM must tell the whole truth about the stability of the dam and its environmental impact. Nosotros estamos dispuestos we are willing to compromise where compromise is possible, but no compromise is possible when it comes to the rights of the Colombian people, the rights of the inhabitants of all the regions affected. When those rights are threatened, then the prosecutor's office will be there to defend the public interest. That's why we will make sure that the whole truth comes to light, and that's why we are insisting on transparency. Supporters by the affected communities hope that the investigations by both the Attorney General and the Prosecutor's Office produce real results which protect the human lives and the ecosystems that were affected by the dam on the Cauca River. La Procuraduría está haciendo... The Prosecutor's Office is taking disciplinary action, which we hope will move forward with this hearing. Yesterday, they also agreed the possible participation of the communities, alongside the authorities, in evaluating the damage caused to these communities. So we managed to make more visible the problems of these communities, who were displaced and lost everything. The Attorney General will also summon for questioning eight officials of Medellin Public Enterprise, or EPM, and other managers of the Iduango Consortium. Meanwhile, the environmental agency, ANLA, has ordered all the construction work of the dam to cease. Only project to contain the effects of the crisis will be allowed to continue.
a gun battle between soldiers and al-Shabaab Islamist fighters has come to an end in Somalia's capital city, leaving at least 20 dead. The raid lasted close to 22 hours and at least 80 people have been injured. The attack started overnight after two car bombs went off and gunmen opened fire on a popular area of Mogadishu. Al-Shabaab took credit for the attack, saying they were targeting a hotel, which is usually frequented by government officials. Protesters in Algeria have clashed with police near the presidential palace in the capital, leading to several casualties on both sides. Events unfolded after a protest against the president's bid to stand for a fifth term in the upcoming April elections. The carnage was clearly visible on the streets as police made their way through smoke and several fires. Tens of thousands took part in protest marches across the country. Algerians demonstrating believe that the 81-year-old isn't fit to lead as he suffered a stroke in 2013 and has rarely been, been seen publicly since. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Shelling has intensified in Indian-occupied Kashmir with the latest round of attacks, leaving seven, seven anti-occupation fighters dead. Skirmishes between both sides on Friday also left at least one civilian dead in Mindar, located near the line of control with Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Hundreds of villagers held a funeral for Amina Akhtar, who was killed by Indian mortar fire. Hostilities between India and Pakistan have also intensified in recent days over the occupied territory of Jammu and Kashmir. When shelling occurs, who dies? Civilians die. Whose loss is it? It's poor people like us who lose. This is not our doing. This is the doing of political leaders. <laughs> Meanwhile, Pakistan has released the captured Indian Air Force pilot. Prime Minister Imran Khan said this was a gesture of peace aimed at easing tensions with its neighbors. Indian citizens and the media gathered at the border to welcome the pilots who they consider a national hero. Carnival in Brazil has started with a political statement in the form of a festive demonstration in support of women, black and indigenous people. In the city of Rio de Janeiro, artists say they felt it was necessary to make a stand against far-right President Jair Bolsonaro. Brazil's carnival is one of the most famous in the world, with millions attending each year. We want to show the bravery of black people, some very important names, mainly women who were eclipsed by chauvinism. We are singing the great names of black women and men, but also native people. We want to show who the real pioneers were, the people who really built Brazil's history. Carnival is also underway in Venezuela with thousands of people ce celebrating across the country. President Nicolas Maduro has said this year's carnival is a celebration of peace, culture and happiness. Venezuelans took to the streets to dance, sing and celebrate as the holiday began. And it's also carnival season in Trinidad and Tobago and traditional mass characters bring history to life on the streets. That's where some of the remaining vestiges of the original carnival spirit can be found, true symbols of freedom and resistance. Citizens kicked off carnival with the reenactment of the 1881 Kambulu riots, the event depicting African resistance to British colonial rule, and the crack of the Jab Jab's whips as they engage in fierce duels have a similar warrior tradition to the Kalinda stick fighters. Meanwhile, the Jab Molais, their bodies daubed with blue paint, devilishly threatened to smear, to smear spectators. All these traditions recalling the trauma of enslavement. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.